Hello and welcome to the very first ever Marketing to Schools show, a program all about helping education companies um, navigate the murky waters of the education sector so that they can get into more schools. Today I'm um, absolutely delighted to be joined by um, Laura McInerney and if you've not yet had the pleasure to hear from Laura, you're in for an, a real treat. So Laura, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having welcome me. To the show. Um, we are going to be talking about your personal growth in a little, little while um, and later on we're going to be looking at the eight step system that we use for our clients to help companies go from um, attracting you know, strangers to their brand, turning strangers into uh, customers, and then customers into active brand promoters. Those schools that you all want, the flagship schools who tell other schools and other teachers just how great your product is. Later on, we'll be explaining the whole process that we use and uh, telling you why you never ever need to buy an email list ever again. So I'm really excited for that and I think you'll love it too. Um, but first up, a bit of news. For anyone who does Facebook advertising, there's two pieces of news that came out very recently. Um, the first one is around the Facebook Pixel. So for anyone who doesn't know, the Facebook Pixel goes onto websites and allows people to measure conversions through Facebook advertising, but also retarget. So you know when you've been shopping online and then you're on Facebook or on other websites, this is the important bit, you're on other websites and you still see ads that say things like, hey, uh, you forgot to check out. Or you see ads that's related to something that you once did maybe 30, 60, even 90 days ago. That's retargeting. Why is this important? Because Facebook, as of the 1st of July, are allowing Facebook users to change a setting around their off-site activity. So that means that users will be able to turn off tracking and what they're doing away from Facebook. That means that the retargeting pixel will be less useful. And your conversions, they're not going to actually align properly. Now, we don't yet know if this is like a cache thing that users will be able to turn on and off or have to sort of re-turn off again and again, or if it's going to be more of a global setting that a user could just say, turn off for good, I don't want anyone to track anything. We don't yet know, but you need to keep an eye on it. It means that you've got to make sure your natural, organic, the, the normal cold ads that you're running are really hitting to the heart of the user because your retargeting is going to be less impactful. The second piece of news that you need to know is for anyone who uses Facebook Messenger bots. Now, another rule's changing again from the 1st of July, whereby you will no longer be able to send broadcast messages outside of the 24 hour plus one rule they will all need to be paid for. So if people are not engaging with your message in the 24 plus one rule, you will have to pay to contact people. There are rare, ex uh, rare circumstantial uh, exceptions to this, and you can apply to Facebook to be considered as part of that. But again, you can need to jump on it early. So just be aware, things are starting to change. So again, we're not big on saying you need to focus on one avenue. Anyone who knows me knows we focus much more on the bigger picture and not being one channel focused. And I think that's really, really important here as well. So I mentioned that we've got a very special guest with us today and I'm absolutely delighted to introduce you to uh, education business owner, guardian, columnist, ex-teacher and court defendant, mm. Laura McInerney. Laura, thank you so much for joining us today. It's, no worries. it's an absolute pleasure to have you on our very, very first show. Yeah, I'm so, I'm so privileged to be here, thank you. Thank you. Um, so you didn't come up in a yellow jacket today. Anyone who doesn't know there is a great story about this. And I'm glad, I'm really glad you didn't come in a yellow jacket because uh, I think people kind of expect that. Sometimes, yeah, there is an amount now that when I turn up somewhere, people will go, hi, Laura, ooh, you're not wearing the yellow jacket. And I, I feel kind of bad. On the other hand, the jacket has a great time. It wanders around flirting with everybody. It's it its own celebrity. Time. Yeah, exactly. And for anyone who doesn't know the story about the yellow jacket thing, why are they talking about clothing and stuff? I mean, you know, clearly I'm conscious about my clothing. Um, can we go back to, was it 2012, back to the court case? Can you just explain to people why uh, the DFE dragged you to court, please? Yes, and why I ended up wearing, and a, yellow ended up jacket, wearing a yellow jacket, bizarrely. So in 2012, I put in, uh, I think it may have been my first, if not my second, freedom of information request. I didn't even know that these laws existed. And they say that anybody in the country who wants to see any document that the government owns has the right to request it. And then there are a series of rules by which the government can refuse you, but only if one of those rules apply. 
and I wanted to find out uh, how people had applied for free schools and that's because if you apply to put a you know an extension on your house you have to submit plans those are all public the decisions are public and I thought well I'll just ask for the application forms and the decisions about free schools and then two years later I found myself in court because pretty much the only rule that the DFE the Department for Education could use to stop me getting the documents was one that was called the vexation rule and that's this lovely British polite word for like you're a pain and we don't like you and so yeah I was taken to court over it and on the day there were three judges all men the Department for Education brought a male barrister solicitor the Information Commissioner's officer brought a male barrister solicitor and I was defending myself and I remember thinking if I try and look like a, a lawyer, I'm going to look like the work experience girl. So I thought, how can I make everyone else feel really bad about dragging me to court? And because freedom of information laws are called sunshine laws, I thought I will dress in bright yellow, including six inch bright yellow heels. So I didn't know that. Yeah. I knew you had the yellow, but I didn't realize it was a connection. I, that's cool. Yeah. That's and I thought every time I stand up, I am going to look ridiculous, but I will look ridiculous on my own terms <laughs> rather than on theirs. And just to, for anyone who doesn't know, so you, basically what you were after was the documentation around these free schools and people who'd applied for them and that were either uh, approved or declined to see is there some sort of like reasoning behind how why things are declined and why some approved because we've later found out that many were approved where technically the score was yes. pretty low Right, and as you know from marketing, you want data, right? You trial things, you'll start new things, and I'm all up for the idea that we try stuff, and then it may or may not work. Mm -hmm. But the important thing is you've got to be improving your campaign over time. You've got to be looking at data and saying this thing worked, this thing didn't, and improving. And that's what I wanted to help the department to do. I was studying at the time and I thought I could do a project to help see if their decisions were accurate or not, their predictions were accurate or not, but they wouldn't give me the documents. I got them in the end though. You did get them in the end. Their argument was that they that there was so much sensitive personal data on there that it would be well, too much effort, too much time, and too much money to remove the data from it in order to give you the papers. Right, which is yeah. actually you're not allowed to do that under the law because as a government you could just stick you know you could just stick your credit card number through every other line and then you'd never have yeah, to give anybody anything. anything absolutely exactly. but you got it in the end I did. you got the information which uh, I think all credit to you because that has I think that's that's game-changing I think now um, it sort of sets a precedent to say that actually as as, as normal people you know we have we're stakeholders in the government and we should be able to see what's happening, decisions that are making, and there should be some level of transparency. And I think fair play to you, because um, it, had it not be for people like you who actually keep fighting this thing and say, no, I'm, I'm not happy with your decision that you're not going to provide me with this, we wouldn't have had the data that we have. And although the data is murky, and although we can't really make any clear assessments from it, at least we have an understanding, and at least we can say that the model the government was going through at the time to make assessments on what is a what will be a good school and what won't be a good school was flawed, fundamentally. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm glad that you I'm glad oh. you think it was a worthwhile endeavour. It was I, a lot of years of my life, so I'm glad as, that I it worked out well. I think it's fantastic, and it brought everyone the yellow jacket, exactly, <laughs> which, exactly. which is if which is a triumph, if not today. Um, so moving on, you were a teacher. You've um, been a Guardian columnist, and you've done loads of things with journalism. You were editor with Schools Week as mm -hmm. well, um, and a a business owner, education yeah. tech business owner. Um, how have you found it so far? Um, I mean, it's weird. I found it weird telling people I was a journalist. I was very comfortable telling people I was a teacher. You get in a car and you tell a taxi driver you're a teacher, they got you. Mm. Tell them you're a journalist, they're not so happy. Tell them you run an app, <laughs> and it's a, slightly, it's a slightly strange conversation. But um, I think what I've been impressed by is um, I didn't really understand the business community and how many people work so hard to create products and services that support schools mm. and teachers um, in many different ways. And, and TeachTap has helped us uncover what teachers are doing and now it's starting to help use that data to get other people to improve what they're doing improve their services that's really exciting so I'm, it is very exciting and I'm, and it I love speaking you know we, we work with clients that are you know absolute startup you know mm. um, mom and pop shop they say you know, with our US clients um, you know it's a person who also has three other jobs and um, I love it because they have a real reason for doing what they're doing there's a real desire I think Anyone who gets into the sector is uh, is a glutton for punishment to begin with, and they're in for a long, hard road, and every day you really are learning something new. Um, there's a lot easier ways to make a lot of money. Um, there has to be a desire and a real passion in something that's sort of like in your belly that says, no, I want to make a difference to kids', difference to kids lives or teachers' lives and so on. 
So before we look at what TeacherTap is mm -hmm. and how that can help um, our, our viewers as well, um, why? Why TeacherTap? Why education? What is it for you that why? What is your why? Well, I mean, I came into education as a teacher, and, and I think this is going to sound actually really corporate, but um, you know, education is the second biggest spend in this country. We spend £30 billion on it every year. It's a massive industry. People hate that word, but I think it's really mm -hmm. important. You know, 8 million children get up every morning. They get out of their beds, they put on school uniforms, they walk down the street, and they walk into 24,000 schools. There are 24,000 little industries, if you like. 500,000 teachers, 500,000 other people out there who are doing allied services to help those teachers. That's like a million people helping 8 million children every day, so that when those children and grow up, they can have the choices in life mm. that we all want for our own children, and therefore. I, that just always seemed the most exciting industry. When I did sociology A-level, um, I did it on uh, gender subject choice. When my statistics A-level, my coursework was on attendance and GCSE score correlations. I've always been reasonably obsessed yeah. with schools and learning and, and how you do that for so many people. So it's a strange why. It's not kind of necessarily there was one kid that turned everything no, around. No, but I know that your, your sort of brain, you're rooted in psychology and we're, we, look, we're geeks, we're human psychology <laughs> geeks. We love, uh, for different reasons, we're all about what makes people tick and click and what's the reasons behind it. And if that's your why, then that's superb. And, and I love the fact that your studies you were doing even back then was mm -hmm. on you know, attendance and GCSE score. I mean, that, that's great. I mean, that's even something to today. But the thing that's, the, the nice tie with that is even that, that's looking at the data, and that's looking for, it's asking the questions that, that I certainly don't know the answers to. And I think, is that, like, the, the, the whole sort of, um, the, the, the space that TeacherTap fills, is it, a actually, could you just explain to people what well, TeacherTap is for yeah. those that don't know? Sure, and I think it's, it's instructive as well that my co-founder on the app, um, Professor Becky Allen, is the, the education data expert, and we've, we've been friends um, for a number of years. I think we found each other, we were like, oh, we both think the same about this. This is super exciting, we should do something. Yeah. And about two years ago, Becky was the professor of a research center and was desperately trying to survey teachers to find out how to improve their training and she just couldn't get hold of them. Teachers don't sit at desks. They're not on email. They're not easily accessible by phone. How do you survey them to improve something if you can't get them? And meanwhile, I was the editor of Schools Week, merrily writing editorials every week saying, teachers are outraged by X, Y, and Z, when in all likelihood I'd read Twitter and had a phone call with three of them. So she came up with this idea of an app, which is what TeachTap is. Um, it's free for teachers to download, very easy to sign up, and each day it asks three questions. Might be, did you eat lunch today? Where was it? What time did you get to school? Might be an opinion question. Um, the education secretary has announced money for ed tech. Do mm -hmm. you agree that this is a good use of cash? And at the end, the teacher gets to see the results from the day before. So they learn what's going on in other schools, what other teachers think. And then on the final page, we have what they call the CPD bullet amongst our, our users, a kind of two to five minute read that gives them some new idea, technique, professional development. And teachers love it because their voices get listened to, they get to learn what other people are doing, and on the way usually to their car, a couple of minutes read, and they think, oh, I've learned something new, I'll try that tomorrow. And it, it, it's been remarkably successful. We now got about 3,600 teachers on every single day. Uh, and when did this start? This was. Uh, so 2017, we started it, but I was still the editor of Schools Week, like yeah. those mum and pops. Yeah. And Becky was over at um, IOE, and so for a year we were both doing full-time jobs on the side, and we brought our other third wheel in, Alex, who did all the. He's a science, was a science teacher, and he was doing everything in the background building it. Wow. So yeah. 3,600 people that you every day a community. Yeah. I think this is something that's that we talk about a lot here. And I mentioned earlier about never buying an email list again, and you know, um, like the, the downsides to PR and all these other things that. A lot of the temptation with a lot of um, education business owners, or business owners in general, mm -hmm. is that they've got a product that they truly believe, and you hope they truly believe that is something that's revolutionary, or going to just impact someone's life and make a change, and that's, that's an amazing thing there. But they, they, they want to shout about it and tell everyone else how great it is. And again, you get it, of course they do. You, know, you want to stand from the, the hilltops and say, look how great it is. The problem is, they don't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to get in front of teachers. And the way that they often do it is they'll buy an email list, or they'll do something, and they'll say, I've got this great thing, it's gonna change your life, and it's 600 pounds, and you should go buy it now. Yeah. And we talk a lot about saying, um, you're asking for marriage before a date. Yeah. Um, everything, as you know, everything we do is all built on human psychology and the way that people form relationships with people. Um, but I'm fascinated with this. You go from an idea of, mm. and, and this is like, when you have a, a product which is almost like the middleman product, mm -hmm. where 
you've got two people to keep happy. It's almost like a recruitment agent where you've got to keep the client happy that wants to hire someone and then the, the, the person happy who's going to actually work for them. Mm. Any one of those sides breaks and it, it fails. How do you go from an idea that the only way that idea is going to work and the only way that you're going to get companies to ask questions is to have an audience but the only real way that you get an audience is to have questions for them to engage with. Like, can you yeah. just tell us about the, what the happened? Yeah. Sure. So obviously, we didn't we didn't realise there was a business in it at the beginning. We were just trying to solve Becky's problem of surveys to do the training and my problem of getting their opinions for exclusive news stories. So actually, the business side, I guess, for us came a little later. Mm -hmm. We also had both worked for a long time by that point within education. We were both well known. We'd done years and years of speaking for free. At events. Um, actually, Becky, Alex, and I had all run an event ourselves called the Touch Paper Problems. We were then involved in Research Ed. So we were deeply well known across mm. the community already. And that meant we could leverage social media in a way that I think most other startups, especially if they're people coming from outside, don't have the luxury of that. Mm. But it was built on a lot, a lot of work to establish that credibility and that reputation. And as the community built up and the teachers saw value in it, what then happened was we had businesses who got in touch and said, oh my, we really want to speak to teachers. You know, we are desperate to mm. find out actually how we can help them. Can we pay you to ask them questions? We keep paying big survey companies a lot of money and they're not giving us actually specialist questions with the right language. They can't get us the, the samples that you can get. Our teachers are across around 2,000 uh, 2, schools on any given right. day. Yeah. So we have a very broad sample and we can reweight it to make it representative. And so we were like, okay, well, Let's, let's do this. And one of the reasons Becky and I both left our job was because then to make this a proper endeavor which could help the teachers and make the product as good as it can be for the teachers learning and can help the wider sector, we've had to think about how we do that well. Um, and that's when we started to build in um, opportunities for people to commission questions um, and now increasingly to provide sponsored opportunities on that final page as well. I think that's great because I think you've hit the nail on the head with something there. That the, the the vast, I believe the vast majority of people are good people. And I believe that the vast majority of people in the education sector want to make a difference. But there is a disconnect because a lot of them have never been teachers. I've never been a teacher and we've, we, we're nine years old. You know, we're not teachers. I don't understand mm -hmm. the teacher's day as well as, you know, as, as I'd love to. And I can never do that without being a teacher. Um, and I think there is a disconnect often with brands and companies who are trying to genuinely help teachers and students out, but they don't know the life of a teacher. And they say, we try to call them and they don't answer. <laughs> yeah, they're teaching, you know, they're doing that thing. Um, so I think it's, it's incredible that you have this platform that, that, that facilitates that sort of quick fire communication where you're not saying, I need you to sit down for two hours and, and discuss with us. It's what are the questions that you need answering? What are the answers to those questions? I suppose in, in line with that then, I'd love to know what's, is, are there any questions or any that you've, any, any answers that you've been given to any questions that have been particularly surprising or something that maybe you didn't realize before? Um, I think there are ones that are surprising in that um, we did one on New Year's Day where we said a genie has appeared and you can have one of three wishes. You can either have top exam results for your kids, total well-being for you and your colleagues, or you could have, we did it with a million pounds one day and we did it with 10,000 pounds another right. day. Yeah. And you know, teachers go for the cash. Yeah, Even absolutely. at 10,000 yeah. pounds, the majority go for the cash. And people were surprised, even I was surprised at how much they went for the cash. The only ones who go for results are secondary head teachers. And even then, they still make the for cash. <laughs> um, now, but there's a difference there, that's, that's surprising. Yeah. I think what's been really useful is stuff that we probably knew, but we've been able to get down on paper about teachers day. And the things that we've worked out about teachers are they get up incredibly early. Mm -hmm. They have to be in work. They cannot be late. So they tend to go to work very early because they miss the What rush. do you mean by very early? Like, what is so, that looking like? So they're predominantly work by 7.30 a.m., oh, um, okay. certainly by 8, I mean, but, but, but by 7.30 a.m. is pretty so common. So for a good, like, hour, an hour and a half earlier than they need to be. Um, Often, yes. Unpaid. Yeah. Uh, Not, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's all yeah. part of the salary, but ultimately the way that um, you, schools work, if you get caught in rush hour traffic... Oh, yeah, that's it. What do exactly. you do with a, a teacher's not there for their class and yeah. 30 kids sitting there? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I was one of those teachers because I used to have a commute that if I left at 6.45, I'd be there by 10 past 7, but if I left at quarter past 7, I may or may not get there. So... Mm -hmm. um, so we, they get very early, 
They have very busy days, so they'll often have up to six lessons. In any given week, they'll have three duties. That means break duty, lunch duty, um, after school gate duty. On at least three days per week, they'll probably have an after school meeting. That could be a staff meeting, a meeting with a parent, a meeting with a pupil. Typically around 4.30, we have this trend of a lot of them going, I'm really sorry, I've got to go home now to pick up my children, especially in primary school, 85% female, many in, in, in sort of 30s and 40s who've got children. And so they've already been at work since 7.30. They've worked all the way through, they then dash off home, do dinner, and then on any given night, around 50% of teachers, uh, primary school teachers with children, are sitting in front of the television marking exercise books. When we specifically ask that question, did you mark exercise books last night in front of the television, around 50% of primary female ch teachers with children are, and it's about 40% overall for everybody. That's incredible, isn't it? And then they go to bed really late, so they're tired. They also work on weekends, yeah. and increasingly we're seeing WhatsApp, Slack groups. You've got to reply to parents within 24 hours on email. So what you see are these very long days that are very, very intensely packed, um, and it, it bleeds into other time. You add on top of that email marketing, yes. or people coming in and saying, can we do a focus group with you? And you can see why the teachers are reluctant. And I think this is, and, and thank you for explaining that, and, uh, and I've learned a heck of a lot there in, in that two couple of sentences alone, so thank you. I think this goes in line with why so many companies, you know, they come to us and they say, we just, I, if I can get in front of a teacher, then they get it. But I can't get in front of them. It's like, you have no idea how busy these, these people are, and it's not that they even don't care about your product. Um, it, it is literally, we haven't got the time. I, I cannot find 10 minutes, 20 minutes in my day to, to look at this thing. And then you hinted on something there. People who know me know I've got a, quite the bugbear. Not necessarily with email marketing per se, but in the, in the way that people think of email marketing, i.e. The buying, the, buying the email list and mm. uh, mass marketing loads of teachers and you know, you'll know make a million pounds and all the rest of it, which just isn't the case. Um, and it's because of this, because email is one of the biggest distractions that anyone has. You know, if you try and plan your day and you've got your email inbox open, it takes one email to come through, everything you were just doing is gone, you're looking to reply to that email and it takes, I think it's like 16 minutes to get back into a task that you were doing before and you just waste so much time. Mm -hmm. So when a teacher's getting an inbox full, of course they're not reading it. And that's why we focus a lot on this, on communication and, uh, and, and, and creating this community. Um, could you, I'd love to know what, um, has there been any particular lesson or anything at all that you've learned, either teach tap or your time before schools week or anything like that, that it's something that's like fundamentally changed or something that was a lesson learned that, that other people could learn from as well, do you think? Yeah, I think this is a really difficult one to talk about because um, I, I, I obviously respect teaching massively. It's, it's my spiritual home and I feel like I am a teacher and I'll stay a teacher whether I'm teaching or not. Um, but I look back on my teaching now and I do think that I was guilty of being reasonably arrogant mm -hmm. in thinking that teachers were the center of the world. Um, you know, you are responsible for 30 children in front of you all of the time. And so you kind of do always expect everybody to bend around you. Yeah. And even when I got to Schools Week and was the editor there, I didn't take seriously, actually, how, how many other people genuinely want to help. Mm. You do see it as everybody trying to take your time and, and get in your way. And I feel a sense of guilt and shame about that, actually, now, and, and some of the conversations and things that I've said to people. At the same time, I don't think you're going to get teachers to change. I'm not sure that I can say anything to those teachers that will mean that they should feel any differently. Mm. Um, but it was a very important lesson um, around how this is not just about 500,000 teachers. It is also about all of the you know, people who come and open the buildings and sit on the reception and the school nurses and the people who fed the kids every day. And I didn't, I was not humble enough around how important those people were. And the best school leaders that I see and the best um, academy trust leaders and CEOs, local authority leaders, get that every single person is important um, within this sector. And if someone is offering help, finding a way that you can take some part of that mm. is actually is a good thing to do. Thank you for that. That's lovely. Um, we're going to be asking people um, each, we, every time for every episode, to bring something with them that has inspired them. Um, that's been something that's had like an impact on their life for whatever reason. Um, and I'm not going to lie, I was thinking, 
I'll put money on it that it'll be the yellow jacket. And, we'll see. <laughs> uh, and then you turn up in the blue jacket and I was like, ah, you wily fox. Um, and that's not the case, clearly. You brought something with us. Um, I have no idea what this is, but I'm intrigued. So sure. could you explain what, yeah. what it is and why? So it's a little postcard from uh, Edward Monckton. And uh, I got this when I was a teenager and it says the butterfly of freedom. Why do you fly outside the box? I fly outside the box because I can, but we know the box. We are safe inside the box. And that, my friend, is why I leave. For you may be safe, but I am free. And I had this on my wall at university, had this on the wall in my classroom. When I taught in several classrooms, I photocopied it big and stuck it in, in various ones. I have it at home in my office now. And it's really important to me, and it was important when I was teaching, because I do think that what drives me in the why is about choices. Yeah. I wanted every child to have as many choices as possible. And if you choose to stay in your box, because safety matters to you, I think that is absolutely valid. But when you are that butterfly that's standing on the edge and the door is open and you could fly out, I want you to feel that in your backpack there, you've got everything that you need to make it on the outside world. And also that if you don't, you can still come back and reload. And that for me was what education was always about. And it's still also what business is about. As we're building Teach Tap and thinking about our culture and our values, you know, we've also got to sometimes take risks. We've also, we will sometimes fail. Mm. We've got to be safe and make sure that our users are safe and that the environment and the app is very safe. But we've also got to push the envelope and try and do things in a new way. So I, I keep the butterfly of freedom always really as a, as a little inspiration. Way more inspirational than a jacket. That's way better than a jacket. I'm so glad you didn't bring the jacket now. That's so much better. And do you know that, that ties in so lovely with, um, with our core. We have seven core beliefs in our business and, and one of its own ones you've seen this, its own poster as well. Um, is that we believe only the very best education products should win. Mm. And the reason for that is that I believe that when a, let's say teacher, um, but when a teacher has access to the very best tools and education, then their children have access to the best tools and education. And that means that the teacher can then, you know, give the one-to-one -one time to the ones that need it most, whatever it may be. But the best education for those children means that each child has a true potential of, of reaching their, 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 their ultimate version of themselves even if that means staying inside their box. Mm -hmm. That's fine, at least they have the choice. My worry is that when schools don't have access to the best tools, and I don't just mean tech, but the best tools, then the kids don't even, they don't have that choice. They've not got the opportunity to break out of the box and do something or to stay in the box. They're sort of constricted within the box regardless, if you like. And, and that's why, for me, it's really important that we help all brands, no matter whether they can afford us or not, we help all companies with the, the understanding and the model that we've devised um, over the last four or five years that just works, which is an eight-step system that takes people from not knowing a brand uh, to, through to knowing, getting excited, buying, buying again, and becoming a big brand advocate. Um, because then it's not about being the best marketer, it's about having the best product that's actually gonna have the biggest impact on the kids or the teachers' lives. And a little earlier on, we actually filmed this, and I'm now gonna show you this eight-step system that we use for all of our clients and how you guys can use it too. Laura, thank you so, so much thank for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure, thank you. So the problem. Your education business probably isn't growing as quickly as it should. But let's start with what's not the problem. Awareness is not the problem. You can get all the awareness you want, and we're going to show you how to do that. Market demand is not the problem. You clearly have something that schools want and indeed need. And your product's not the problem because, fact, your product's great. Or at least it should be, and I'm sure you guys think it is. Um, the big caveat to everything I'm going to teach today and in all the upcoming videos is that this stuff really works, but it works when your product's good. Um, you will get found out if you've got a terrible product. If you've got a terrible product, you may as well stop watching now. Please make your product better before focusing on any marketing. So what is the problem? This is the problem. Your customers just don't get it. They don't get it. Time and time again, we hear from companies that say to us, um, you know, guys, get us in front of someone. Get us a demo. Let me show a teacher what our product does. And they get it and they want to buy it. But until that point, they don't get it. That's what we need to address. How do we do that? A customer value journey is this solution. So what is customer value journey? It is a scientific uh, process for predictable and profitable growth that we've tailored for the education sector. Let's do a bit of background stuff here first. Fact, sales and marketing have changed. Remember when this was a thing? Or this, I paid for an email campaign to 30,000 teachers and nobody bought from me. Or what about this? I paid thousands of pounds to exhibit at BET, 
And my leads won't answer my calls. 57%, really important number. 57% is how far along the sales process a B2B customer is before they engage with a salesperson. So look, sales, marketing have indeed changed, but one thing hasn't. Humans. We often talk about B2B, B2C, how we sell to teachers, selling to um, head teachers, who the, uh, you know, who the key decision makers are within the schools. We're not. We're always dealing with humans. We're a human brand with human people behind it selling to humans. And we've got to remember that. It's so, so important. And this is the reason it's important. Our whole business is built around this book, Intimate Behavior by Desmond Morris, zoologist. And Desmond basically wanted to look at how um, humans form relationships with other humans and if there's a pattern behind it. If we think of, you know, gorillas pumping the chests and all the rest of it. As humans, do we have some sort of pattern that we go through psychologically and uh, with chemically to move from not knowing a person through to our most intimate time when we're sleeping together? And if you think how weird that is, there's a time in life when we don't know the person that we're then spending the most intimate time of our life with. And Desmond indeed did discover that there is a pattern and a path that we go through, and it's 12 different stages. The first stage is eye to body. It kind of makes sense, you know, if you want to meet someone, you kind of got to see them, you kind of got to know that that person exists. But you knowing that they exist is not enough, they've kind of got to see you and know that you exist as well, as it's a little bit weird. Then voice to voice, hand to hand, arm to shoulder, arm to waist or a hug, and I'll come back to huggers in a second. We all know huggers and we all know people who hate hugging. Mouth to mouth, I just found this one interesting, hand to head. Hand to head is more intimate than a kiss. But it does kind of make sense. If you think of someone putting their hand at the back of your head, that's kind of an intimate thing to do. Then we have hand to body, and we have mouth to body, and as you imagine, the arm starts to get a little bit blue, uh, hand to so-and-so, and then we get the uh, bomb chicka wow wow. And these 12 stages are really important because this is what people go through uh, to form a successful uh, intimate relationship with another person. And what doesn't want to identify then was what deems success. Is it about the amount of time that you spend in these stages? And to some, what you could argue it is. We know the phrase being like friend zoned, where you're kind of spending too long in these, these upper parts. Then it becomes weird to move further through. But actually, the thing that had the biggest impact on success of forming an intimate relationship isn't really to do with the time that a person spends in any one of these stages, but it's more to do with how many sequential stages a person misses. In Desmond's um, study here, anyone that misses three or more stages is actually committing assault. Then you think, well, why is this so important for us as a business? You know, I don't want to sleep my customers, and please, I'm not at all advocating that in any way. But it's so, so important because if you think of what we do as a business, there's a time when our customers have never heard of us. Let's take Apple, for instance. There's a time when a person doesn't know Apple exists. There's a time when they hear about Apple. There's a time when um, they try Apple out, and they discover Apple, and then they buy into the Apple product. Then they buy into the brand, and they start buying more and more Apple products, and they start telling all their friends how great Apple is, and they become a big, active brand promoter of Apple. It's following a very, very, very similar path to those 12, 12 stages of human intimacy. But we've adapted it to eight stages of a buying cycle and moving people from not knowing you exist to buying, becoming excited, and becoming a massive active brand promoter because regardless of what anyone thinks, it's not sales that you want. What you want is active brand promoters, teachers, schools, humans, who will go and tell other humans how great your product is, how much it's transformed their life. And we do that through our customer value journey, which is this eight-step process where people become aware that you exist, they engage with you at some level. They subscribe to a, a piece of content. Again, we'll go through how this maps up shortly. They convert, they get excited, they ascend, they become advocates, and then finally they become active brand promoters. And this is what we're going to break down right now and over the coming uh, weeks and over the coming sessions, we're going to take each individual stage and look at what we can do to fulfill these spaces. Let's start with aware. Um, People have to be aware that your brand exists before they're going to buy from you. So let's just look at human side for a moment and what this means. We're in the second week of university and I'm stumbling out of the uh, one of many 
pubs that we've probably been to that evening. Possibly this is just the uh, student union bar actually. And I stroll out of it and I see, to me, what's the most beautiful lady, a beautiful woman I, I, I'd ever seen. I, I don't know why I thought this was a good idea, but I started singing She's Like the Wind to her. I'm not going to advocate that as a really great thing to do, but what I will say is she's now my wife, so it kind of worked. But all I was doing there in my own weird, twisted way was I was saying, hello, I exist. And that's what we're doing in the aware stage. We're just saying, hey there, we exist. But existing is not good enough unless people engage with you. This is the kind of, hey, how are you doing stage? You know, we want to have a conversation and speak with people. Once they're speaking, we want to have like a micro-commitment that, that's starting to move this relationship to the next stage. You know, it's swapping phone numbers. It's fine if we meet someone and we're talking to them, but then we kind of want to swap phone numbers, and we're doing that on the basis that something else is going to happen. That something else being going on a date, going on multiple dates. If we think of our end goal here being, you know, getting with someone and marrying them, these are the steps we go through. And I'm going to pause for a second because as a business, how many of you are basically doing this? So for our first day, I was thinking we could figure out the names of our children. Terrifying your potential customers by just jumping in straight away with, oh, so we're gonna get together and we're gonna you know, think about our kids' names, or let's put this in the business sense of, I know you don't know me, I know you've never heard of me, I know we've not really spoken about anything, but do you wanna buy my product? Do you wanna try my product? It terrifies people. Then we get excited, we've been on a date, we've been on multiple dates, we get excited about the idea of maybe spending more time with this person and becoming you know, something more serious. Before we ascend and we, you know, we, we meet the parents, and then we get married and then you know, have babies and all the rest of it that goes with it, before you know, we become big advocates and say, oh, my wife's amazing, and we tell everyone how great they are. This analogy does break down at this point here. Active brand promoters doesn't kind of work unless you're into that sort of like bigamy stuff, which, again, I'm not advocating, but you know, each to their own, I suppose. So what does this mean from a business point of view and from the education side, and how do we actually take this model, this eight-step model, and the psychology and the, uh, the science behind it, and put it in, create a system that takes people from not knowing about who we are to becoming this active brand promoter? Here's an example. Aware. We run a Facebook ad. We run a Facebook ad. How are we going to get people to engage with us? Well, the Facebook advert and the landing page that we're going to pull people to, that's going to engage them. It's going to resonate with them. The messaging is going to say, hey, teacher, hey, head teacher, hey, human, I get what it's like in you. I get what you're after, and, and we can help with that. And we're not going to sell. We're going to offer them a subscribe piece. We're going to swap phone numbers. We're going to offer a downloadable piece of content in return for their email address. Then we're going to convert them through email automations. We're going to push them, or messenger bot automations. We're going to push them into what we need. If you like our download, if that made a lot of sense to you, then you should probably take a trial of the product. Or you, know, you should probably get on the demo call with us and let us show you how our product can actually help you even further. They're going to get excited. They're going to be excited through the delivery of the demo that you're doing or trying out the actual product and thinking, hey, this thing's actually really cool and the messaging's right and I get what this is going to do for my life and for my school, my class and the kids that's there. And then they're going to buy. And they'll buy a one-year license, then a three-year license, then maybe a five-year license, and they'll buy the extra modules and the widgets and the rest that you have on there because they're constantly excited and seeing the impact that the product is having, so they're going to buy and buy again. And they'll become an advocate, and they'll give you the case studies, and they'll get the testimonials before we then finally get them over to that final stage of flagship promotion schools. Those big schools that are going to go out, tell all those other schools and those other teachers um, just how amazing your product is because they've gone through this journey, they understand the process, and they feel and they, they get the impact that this has had on their life. So over the coming weeks, throughout all of our video sessions, we're going to take individual stages and individual elements of each individual stage and show you how to do them. We're gonna go and take how we're gonna run a Facebook ad, we're gonna run, you know, how we're gonna do an email automation tool. We're gonna to look at all these incredible things that we could be doing so that you never need to buy an email list again and spend money on 30,000 people that don't reply. That if you go to bet, you have a plan in place and a strategy that's going to get those leads calling you. That you don't need to worry about they're not getting back in touch. You can have a strategy in place that's gonna run 24 seven, even while you sleep, even on Christmas day, that's pulling in um, leads, if we want to call it that, or humans who are genuinely interested, intrigued by your product, who are going to want to take part, want to try it out, want to have a conversation with you, and you'll be best placed to actually push them to that next stage. And I really can't wait to share this with you.